Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's 1 million by 1 million strategy roundtable for entrepreneurs. 1M by 1M, as you know, is the first and only global virtual accelerator for technology and technology-enabled services startups in the world. Our mission is to help a million entrepreneurs reach a million dollars and beyond in annual revenue. And as you can imagine, a million companies are not going to get funded. But um, there are companies that in our portfolio or in our community who seek financing and we support their pursuit for capital. But also categorically, we support entrepreneurs who are self-financed and bootstrapped as well. Hence, the mission of democratizing entrepreneurship. Now, these roundtables, these free mentoring sessions have been going on now for more than 10 years. We started in the fall of 2008. So we have done 416 of these sessions so far. And uh, over 75,000 people have attended these sessions. Our entire community today is over half a million people. And uh, it's been a real uh, kind of magic, you know, to be able to work with so many entrepreneurs in so many corners of the world. Uh, we see people coming to these sessions from everywhere. And, you know, I don't know what we have today, Maureen would know, but uh, we have seen people coming from Africa, people coming from all corners of Europe, We've coming, people coming from India, actually all corners of India, which I find absolutely fascinating sometimes. We have seen people coming from the foothills of the Himalayas. So it's, it's really something powerful and something tremendously meaningful for us who are working on this behind the scenes and in front of the camera for uh, years, actually. So uh, the event is being recorded. You have... Um, every single recording available on our YouTube channel, 1M1M Roundtables. So if, you're, if you have time to kill, if you have commute, or if you have to, you know, if you have just, just basically have some time, feel free to go listen to these roundtables. It's a great learning material. And uh, we have guests, we have pitches. You will learn a lot from the pitches. The whole philosophy of the program is case study-based learning. We just did an audit on how many case studies we have. We have over 870 case studies. So it's been a massive body of work that has come together here. Um, if you are following, if you're live tweeting the show, use hashtag 1M1M. On Twitter, you can follow our content at 1M by 1M and at Romana. We publish a huge amount of quality, rich, in-depth content from which you can learn uh, it's informational content, inspirational content, educational content, and you'll, you'll really learn a lot by just following our content. These are the call-in instructions. This is a roundtable, not a broadcast. So you are very welcome to participate as much as you would like. I will um, put the slide up a little bit later after we are done with the scheduled programming so we can have open Q&A. Um, in the meantime, you have the public chat make sure you set your WebEx chat to send to all participants. That way you can uh, talk with anybody uh, in the room and uh, do that. Please line up your questions and do participate. Do weigh in, do ask questions, do share your thoughts. But we're gonna to start today with a special guest, Miriam Rivera from Ulu Ventures. Miriam, welcome to the program. Thank you, Srana. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. So Miriam, uh, in order to introduce you to our audience, I think the first place we would like to start is to uh, explain about Ulu Ventures and your background. Tell us about your investing focus, how big is the fund, what kind of investments do you like to make? Let's just get to know one another. Okay, so I started Ulu Ventures about 10 years ago. Um, I'm uh, one of the co-founders. And I did this after I had been uh, at Google, where I was a very early employee and helped to grow the company 
from about 160 employees when I joined to about 15,000 employees and contractors by the time and I, I left from 85 million in revenue to about $10 billion. And I worked on a lot of our early partnership deals that uh, generated um, the lion's share of that revenue and as well as our um, advertising partnerships, um, which again were responsible for um, billions of dollars of that revenue as well. I started Ulu Ventures in part because I wanted to, um, you know, I, I share a lot of your mission in terms of wanting to democratize access to venture capital here in the U.S. And uh, in our country, we have uh, so much talent that's coming from so many different parts of the world, um, and oftentimes uh, they're not getting access to venture capital. Um, in particular, women only get about 2% of the venture capital dollars, even though women have exceeded men in terms of educational attainment in this country. Um, and they're certainly underrepresented relative to their um, participation in the tech sector. The same is true for um, underrepresented minorities in this country and often even immigrants who are probably overrepresented in the tech sector um, as a percentage of the population. Um, and so at ULU, um, we use a very quantitative process to help make our decisions around investments and the uh, basic idea is that we're going to treat all comers um, kind of the same. Uh, and what typically happens is often that the criteria tend to change depending on who's the person uh, being addressed as an entrepreneur. And we want to try to avoid um, having cognitive bias in our process so that we really can access talent um, from wherever it comes. And uh, as a result, we have uh, really a much more diverse set of entrepreneurs um, in Silicon Valley than um, what our industry has. And you know, we probably have about a third of our entrepreneurs are women, for example, which is more representative of their participation in the tech sector. Um, the same kinds of numbers, uh, you know, relative proportions are coming out uh, for groups like underrepresented minorities who might you know, make up about 10% of the sector, and that's what we're seeing. So uh, we don't have a, an explicit uh, quota or um, number that we're trying to reach, but we do um, actually tend to uh, get a diverse base that is representative of what we're seeing in the tech sector here um, by applying a more quantitative um, and objective process that's called decision analysis. So Ulu Ventures is a seed stage firm. We focus on uh, early stage investments. We're often the first dollars into uh, companies when people have one to six founders is not an unusual um, uh, number. And we have about, you know, or about employees. And there's usually about two of them on average. Um, we typically invest about $500,000 in the companies. And our uh, Fund two is a $66 million fund, and we're about half invested um, at this point. Well, uh, what you said about diversity obviously is music to our ears because that's very much our community, and uh, we, we're very happy to see that that's what you're doing and, and uh, that people are paying attention to this issue a lot more right now, and, and, and that's progress for sure. Um, let me ask you a little bit more about the stage. So seed today is no longer, you know, when I was doing uh, my earlier startups in the late 90s, I did three in a row, but just at the time it was seed and series A. But now it's, you know, friends and family, pre-seed, seed, post-seed, pre post pre-series A, small series A, traditional series A. The spectrum has uh, segmented. Where do you see yourself in that continuum? So it's funny. We would, we probably end up everywhere, even up to a traditional Series A. I guess I would say. And you're right that sometimes the funny thing is that uh, a lot of people um, consider themselves early stage investments. By the time somebody gets a Series A, there often have been three rounds of financing in the company and. Um, in different companies, we have participated in three rounds before um, there is a traditional Series A. Uh, I guess our 
our focus would typically, it typically depends on the companies that we see and the opportunities that are in front of us, but a lot of people are uh, raising capital at each of those stages, as you say, um, from fans, friends and family rounds, um, and so sometimes we'll make a smaller investment, but our typical um, investment amount is uh, 500000 But we've, you know, made investments as uh, low as 100000 And here the uh, seed category has kind of increased in size over the 10 years that I have uh, been investing so actively. And they've kind of moved from seed rounds being about $500,000 total to um, now, you know, seed rounds being up to three to four million dollars. And it really just depends on the nature of the business. And also, frankly, I think it depends on the availability of capital. There's been so much capital coming into the sector that um, rounds have just gotten larger. Um, some of them are, you know, priced, I, I think, extremely high. And uh, our quantitative process helps us avoid overpaying on companies. Now, uh, what do you like to see? Would you invest, for example, would you invest in concept stage ventures, or is that not part of the uh, procedure? We have, it's a pretty rare thing. We've probably made about 100 and, uh, it'll be a little over 100 investments uh, this week. And so the typical company has usually had some sort of proof of concept um, launch of a product, may have um, some pilot customers. We, we tend to focus on enterprise um, applications and uh, not consumers, so it's a little different um, business. And the majority of them are either in some sort of a pilot discussion, may even have um, a term sheet with a customer that's waiting for a product, that kind of a thing, as opposed to um, a pure proof of concept uh, or just like a deck, you know, but we have actually on very rare occasions made one. So SoFi was one of our companies where we made an investment on the basis of a deck. Um, and that was in part um, because we, um, my partner had known uh, one of the principals in a, his prior work at Wells Fargo, um, knew that he was really one of the smartest people in banking and so therefore um, there was a heightened level of comfort um, with that particular uh, concept. And, you know, I think that they, they were also a more mature company that was very clearly um, setting themselves up to um, comply with securities regulations, um, banking regulations, and had the appeal to draw in um, very senior people from within uh, those kinds of sectors um, to help grow their business. Mm -hmm. So uh, what about geography? Do you invest only in Silicon Valley or are you investing outside as well? Um, I would say it's probably 95% of our investing is in Silicon Valley. We have some investments in other parts of the United States and some in other places in the world. Um, I would say that our most successful investing has been um, in the Silicon Valley area and that you know, it's, it's interesting, but if you look at uh, venture capital as a whole, um, most of the investments made by venture capitalists happen to be within um, 100 miles of the home office, let's say. And the and I, I'm on the board of the Kauffman Foundation in Kansas City, which is uh, studies entrepreneurship um, and has publicized a, a lot of information about entrepreneurship. And, you know, they're trying to change that even here in the United States where only 4% of venture capital dollars are expended in the center of the country and almost all of it is expended on the coast. Right. That's true. So uh, what about sector? You said you do mostly or all enterprise software investments. Could you elaborate on what do you like to invest in these days? What trends are you following or are you excited about? Do we have a bit of a flavor? Yep. So a lot of our companies are traditional SaaS companies, um, but many of them are, you know, we're also invested in things like Internet of Things, um, certainly AI, which I think of 
really as just the next step in machine learning. Um, and smart data is really one of the big focuses of our investing. Fin financial uh, technologies are another one that we've uh, made a lot of investments in, as well as education technologies. Um, so most of the things that differentiate us is that we are selling into an enterprise customer, and typically large enterprise. We do have some that are selling into small enterprise, but that's, again, um, more unusual. But we also consider enterprise um, to be a little different from you know, the traditional like uh, Fortune or Global 2000 type of companies, but um, to also include, for example, selling education technologies into schools and mm -hmm. or educational related services into the schools. Yeah. Okay. So let's double click down on, on your portfolio. Let's talk about some of the highlights of your portfolio. And as you are explaining some of these, give us some insight into your thought process on when these companies came to you, what did they have, and, and what did you see that attracted you or convinced you that this is going to be one of your few portfolio companies? Okay. So we have, um, I'll start with one of our recent investments that I think is very relatable, which is a company called Zoom, Z-U-M, um, and they're in the transportation space. Um, and one way that people might describe them is that they're Uber for kids. And they're Uber for kids um, typically related to school uh, transportation. And one of the things, when they initially started, they were going down kind of a a testing path. Um, the, it's actually a founding family. Um, there's a sister and two brothers, um, all uh, immigrants from India, who came uh, to the U.S. Uh, two of them were in a Stanford Master's in Management program here in Silicon Valley. Um, after they had been uh, working, uh, the brother, one of the brothers in uh, technology in the eastern part of the United States, the other brother had been working for the India military uh, managing logistics, and then um, the sister had been working t in tech here in Silicon Valley. And so they came uh, to this idea of a company just based in part on life experience and the difficulty that um, two-parent working households have in managing transportation to and from school, um, sports after school, um, pickups. Um, sometimes from sports in different cities. Um, and the interesting thing was that there was a, um, there was a, another company that had already been in the market that was, um, had raised substantial capital. They had um, maybe raised over $10 million in capital at the time. And so they were kind of coming from behind, if you will. But um, with only $200,000 of capital, they were able to generate um, a third of the rides of the company that had um, generated, that had already raised um, $10 million. And so we thought they're onto something. <laughs> um, yeah. And one thing that they were onto, um, I think, was this, uh, and they didn't quite know it yet because the data was still, you know, not as clear. But what they were trying to do was also selling to the schools as opposed to just selling directly to parents, which was how the other company in the space had been going to market. Um, so they were having radio ads, for example, which are very expensive um, ads on Google mm -hmm. and Facebook, et cetera. Um, and, and this company, Zoom, was going directly to schools and saying, you know, we can um, help transport your kids from the train station to the school, from the school to the sports, uh, and also, you know, you can make us available to the parents if, if they want to have their kids picked up uh, from the sports and brought home, those kinds of things. And those conversations were working. Schools were very interested in what they had to say, and it turned out that this was a, a very cost-effective way of reaching more consumers more quickly because, obviously, each school is essentially a viral mm -hmm. network. And so, um, one, we thought that the, and also the focus wasn't on price competition. The, the other company that had been in the space was using um, Uber and Lyft drivers uh, to come and pick up students. But what would happen sometimes is that uh, there was 
surge pricing, which increased the money that a driver could make doing a different pickup than picking up a child. And so literally they were leaving children behind, <laughs> which as any mother would know is completely unacceptable. Yeah. And um, you know, the other company was run by men and this one was run by a mom. Um, and so I think she really related to the issues. Um, she really related to the customer's needs. She understood the importance of safety and reliability and understood that for the parents, um, reliability was more important than the price. Um, and so they tend to have a, a more stable set of drivers. They tend to um, pay a, a bigger fraction than other um, transportation companies to the drivers. And they uh, try to develop a set of uh, drivers and relationships around the family so that the family um, has more comfort. They also have um, tracking technology to let the parents um, be able to know where their child is at any time. So it's an Uber for uh, bringing children to school and activities. Yeah, and they're growing very quickly. They went from being in one school district last year to being in 103 school districts this year, from having 30 schools to 2,000 schools in one year. Awesome, fabulous. Okay, all right, well, let's do another, maybe another example of something that you've invested in that's representative of how you think. So Arch is a company, Arch Systems is a company that is in the Internet of Things space, and they were started by a set of founders that had worked in the Peace Corps, and in the Peace Corps they uh, had really wanted to develop sensors that would allow people to um, kind of test um, well water quality um, and be able to tell people at a distance because many people are walking um, pretty great distances to sources of water. And they uh, wanted to develop a reliable and really low cost approach to um, censoring this type of uh, water access and realized that it was a really challenging problem to do it um, cheaply and part of that was that you typically required a prototyping phase and then um, a manufacturing phase, um, meaning that you developed something and then you built it out and then you kind of spec'd it out and then you could um, have a manufacturer build something. So for a number of years they worked in a not-for-profit um, to help develop these sensors and then they realized that they also had something that could now be a potential commercial application so they founded a company to, um, to uh, take these kinds of sensors um, and their process and be able to help any company um, build Internet of Things devices. And their great insight was, um, you know, a very old insight um, similar to um, what the Japanese did in the 70s, which was to say, why don't we design for manufacturability from the outset? Um, and that will help us to reduce our cost, to increase our quality, et cetera. And so what they did was develop software that could go from um, design through manufacturing um, and reduce the need for different skill sets, which are difficult to find um, now because everyone went to um, computer science and, and many people moved away from electrical engineering and hardware engineering over the last decades. And so it's actually very difficult to build devices because you don't have as much of this expertise um, available. But what we know is that everybody in the world is trying to run their operations more efficiently and also um, there are many applications for technology from the field. Um, and whether it be uh, wells, agriculture, or um, uh, meters, um, for water or energy, um, and also factories, right? So essentially a factory is a set of um, machines um, that may be um, all in one physical location, um, but a company may have many physical locations in which they're producing goods. And people would like to be able to um, run those factories more efficiently by being able to measure production, understand when there's a problem with the machine, understand what the problem with the machine is, and so Arch is working with, um, now they have 
um, entered into a relationship with one of the world's largest manufacturers to um, help provide this kind of data in the field um, so that they can uh, run factories as if the machines were actually related and communicating to each other by taking data from a huge variety of machines and sending it into um, a central um, data architecture where they can then uh, track production and uh, problems with machines. And what did they come to you with? What did they have when you invested? So I think the things, and again, these were three people. Um, they had essentially developed the prototypes of these devices and the, mm -hmm. um, essentially the ability to um, code these kinds of devices and software. So they had, um, and, and part of that was that they had already spent several years um, in this not-for-profit um, version of what they were doing, pursuing this um, goal of developing cheaper devices that could be used in contexts that were often, um, you know, where technology wasn't being used in the field. And so they had both experience, they'd shown tremendous commitment um, to what they were doing and to creating um, affordable and very quick to produce devices, and that was something that could reduce the cost of creating a Internet of Things device by an order of magnitude, um, and also uh, make it uh, uh, something that could happen in months as opposed to typically more like a year from prototype to manufacturability. Ma'am, are you chasing unicorns? Um, not generally, <laughs> because uh, you know when we're investing in the companies that we do, um, the chance of failure it tends to be incredibly high. Um, probably, you know, our expectation is that about uh, two thirds of our companies may really amount to um, nothing. Um, we've actually been luckier than that in the in the real practice of our business. So. Um, in Fund 1, uh, where we had made 64 investments, um, we have only had um, on the order of 15 to 20 percent of those companies go out of business, which in 10 years is not bad um, given mm -hmm. the level mm -hmm. of uh, risk involved in early stage startups. But the reality is, is that most of those businesses will probably not be high returning businesses financially. Um, and that's true of the industry as a whole. Venture capital in the United States, um, there are about 4,000 investments made each year, but only about 2.5% of the dollars invested are returning most of the profit in the entire industry. And even for the top VC firms, uh, about 4.5% of their investments uh, generate about 60% uh, of their profit. So. Um, we're in a highly risky business, but what I would say is that it's a business that is hits driven. If you think about um, how many businesses work, like let's say um, the movie industry, uh, the drug industry, um, the oil industry, many of them are actually dependent on um, trying to find a blockbuster drug, a blockbuster movie, a blockbuster mm -hmm. well. And actually, venture capital is is one of those industries. So everybody, in a sense, is chasing unicorns, but we try to do it before anybody else knows they're unicorns. So um, you will find this comment interesting um, with your Kaufman Foundation board hat on. Uh, we are bringing on a lot of investors onto our community who are who have observed that most of the exits in the technology industry are $50, 60000000 million exits. So that means that you can't really raise tens of millions of dollars and expect to make any profits out of 50, 60 million exits. So they are going for small capital efficient ventures and then early exits so that they can stay within that window. And, uh, and there is a class of micro VCs developing who are focusing on that where I think the it doesn't have to be that kind of swing for the fences, have to have a home run, have to have a hit kind of thing. You can you create a niche value and, and 
as long as there is enough STEM that gives a corporation, a strategic acquirer, a foot into an area that they want to get into, you can still have a successful, you know, even 5x, 10x kind of return. Yes, so, um, I, I think a lot of different models of how people um, pursue early stage venture, and I, and you know, frankly, there's a lot of companies that are building technologies that are going to be features as opposed to standalone companies, and they're well positioned for acquisition. And I think that um, you know that is um, one model that can definitely be pursued profitably um, in this sector. For myself. Um, I have chosen to do this for uh, partly for some of our reasons around democratizing access to venture capital. Um, I'm playing this kind of a game because I've been really fortunate. My parents were migrant farm workers and factory workers. They came here from Puerto Rico, um, and I was a full scholarship student myself. I'm a first-generation college graduate. And I want to show Silicon Valley that people like me, people like us, can really achieve that kind of success in um, technology companies. And you know, I believe that because I've had such good fortune to both attend Stanford University, to have been uh, an entrepreneur myself uh, back in the 90s, um, to then uh, work at a company like Google, I have access that maybe others like me wouldn't have, and I'm going to use that access to demonstrate what we can do. Yeah. Yeah, but part of the mission of what we are doing is also to provide that access to a vast number of people um, in a very systematic way. So I know you have to run to Stanford for an event, so uh, thank you for participating and sharing your thoughts, and, and very nice to meet you. Thank you so much, Romana. It's been a pleasure to meet with you. Okay, folks, we're going to switch to the entrepreneur pitch session next. I want to set a bit of expectations, and then we're going to uh, hand it over to you, the presenters. Now, remember, this is a safe working session. We have no other agenda here besides working on your ventures and giving you some feedback with which you can do something, actionable feedback. And we are on your side, so feel free to uh, share whatever it is that you're struggling with and we'll try to address and give you perspective. Um, now, it is possible that you might disagree with what I tell you today. Don't feel bad about that either. It's your venture. You can do whatever you want with it. You will do whatever you want with it. Take the feedback, think about it, and decide what is the right strategy, what feels right to you. Um, one thing, though, you will have to pay attention to is not all businesses can raise money, not all businesses should raise money, and raising money doesn't guarantee success. This is a fact. It's not a non it is a non-negotiable fact. So we're going to start with Mohan Pereira from Melbourne, Australia. Mohan, you must be up at a very odd hour, so thank you for staying up. Tell us what you're working on. Okay, it is. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Yes. Hi. Um, I said Mohan Ferreira is my name. Um, that's me in the picture. Um, if you move to the next slide, I'd like to start with where we started. Our, cons our, our innovation was actually the journey of our life. I run a successful transport company. We deliver about two and a half million parcels a year, about mm -hmm. 60, uh, 50 plus vans. In our business from 2010 to 14, we built a system, a manual process to manage our people, our assets, and our process. Up until 2015, we thought we had everything set up while one of our disgruntled employees went to the union and they, they aired a national television uh, program about me saying how I was uh, being a bad employer taking advantage of Australian workers, which was well, not true. However, it triggered compliance audits on our company by three different authorities, mm -hmm. which I realized having compliance is so detrimental if you don't have it, I could have mm -hmm. lost my entire business. So 
So mm-hmm. that is the time I had a paper-based system, but I realized paper-based system does not give you visibility. We decided to digitize what we had at that time, in 2015. Mm-hmm. In 2018, we decided what we had was limited, so we went to the cloud-based version. It's all about getting our compliance right. We have right visa, we, our people have the right licenses, our people have the right contracts, and our people have the right authority and identification and making mm-hmm. sure they have not expired and making sure we have the right documentation retained at any given time to show it to anybody. Based on this was the original idea, but we built so many things along the way. In two, the, the, mm-hmm. two weeks ago, our company was awarded with ISO 9001 quality management system. Mm-hmm. And one of the things the auditor said was we had never seen a single platform used to run a business. People, assets, process, compliance, everything. Our, our so company... Let me, yep. let me understand here. You, you had a transportation company and you ran into this problem. Then you developed this software. But is this compliance software part of the transportation company or did you start another company for the software? We started another company for the software. And what happened to the transportation company? Still running. We are the first user of the software. Okay. All right. So you're running both companies right now? Correct. Okay. Got it. All right. And do you have, besides besides your transportation company, does anybody else uh, do you have any other customers for this compliance software yet? Not yet. We just started marketing about two weeks ago. Got it. Okay. All right. These are some of the results I res- I got myself by running maybe because of this software. To get one person on board to go through their documentation to make sure they have the right work rights, their licenses, their contracts, and everything else, it took us about 90 minutes per employee in the past. Now it's 10 minutes. Mm-hmm. Be- before this program, it took us about 31 days to get somebody trained and job ready to take on a full delivery run. Now we mm-hmm. do that in eight days. Okay. Previously, our staff turnover, very typical for our industry, is about 20%. We dropped it by 50%. It's all based on the, I'm not doing anything magic, but everything is systematically um, controlled. So the value proposition that we looked at is who suits our industry uh, or product is companies that hire blue color labor force, which mm-hmm. has highly regulated industries, compliance is critical. There yep. are three things we do. We do workforce verification, licenses, identity, and make sure they have the visa to work. And also the program makes you job ready, get you on board quickly, do all the inductions and do the training in a very systematic, methodical manner. You don't miss mm-hmm. anything. Once you get the people right on board, the management of it removes the risk, make sure compliances are there. If anything expires, it alerts you and yeah. also allows you to manage your work health and safety. Right? Got it. Next slide. Okay. Yeah. Yep. In the value proposition wise, the pain points we have spoken to quite a few customers. In fact, you asked me um, who are your um, customers. The very first customer I pitched was Australia Post. They they onboard about mm-hmm. thirty five thousand people per yeah. year. As a result of our presentation, they liked the program so much. They said, "Come on board to our um, as part of our um, accelerator program because we were interested in developing a very similar thing in our experience. In our market is asking for such thing, so they took us as part of their accelerator program. However, two weeks later, uh, they made a decision." They want to go to the market with their product. 
not oh. with someone else's product. So I said, good luck. Thank you very much. At least you big giant like my product. I know it is valuable for everybody else in the market. So yeah. our findings are the pain points of a lot of companies who are hiring high turnover staff products yeah. are it takes too yeah, long to get someone on board. It takes too much effort because at the moment it's paper-based. You're filing documents, and it's highly administrative. Yeah. The impact so we tell, have given. Um, tell me, you know, in the interest of time, tell me where mm-hmm. we could uh, help you. What, where, what? Um... Okay. Now, what I'm trying to do is this is the way I want to go to the market. We want to look at smaller transport companies at the beginning. And yeah. we're struggling with it because smaller trans companies, transport companies don't want to spend money. They like rather mm-hmm. suffer a compliance crisis than spending a small dollar amount to get a system. Mm-hmm. Our next step we're looking at is larger transport companies who has about 50 to 200 to 500 trucks. Mm-hmm. Going to them is the question like you ask, who are your current customers? So I'm mm-hmm. kind of a chicken and egg situation. I can't get the small ones on board with money. Free of charge? Yes, I can. Uh, with money, I can't. Uh, no, I don't say I can't. I'm, I'm soon to make sure I'm doing the right thing. So we identified transport industry, aged care and nursing industry, and facilities management where a lot of contractors come in and out to manage bigger buildings and apartments. So, so you're quoting some numbers have. here in terms of how much revenue you can make off each of these sectors. So that I presume Correct. that you have a pricing model in mind. What is that pricing model? We are looking at about $120 per year per person on board. So if I get a trucking company with about 500 people, uh, we would charge them 500 into $120 per month. Per year, sorry. Per year, okay, got it. All right, so, um, you know, one thing that is very effective in uh, – what I like very much is your very, very focused, targeted approach. So I think, you know, tracking the transportation industry in this mode is great because you will be able to, um, you know, generate – PR around what your you have a transportation company that is using the software and you have ROI analysis based on that. So what I would do first and foremost is to publish some of that in uh, in the media, and this is something we can help you with. If you you know stick around later on after the presentations, I'm going to explain how to use One Million by One Million. One of the things that I would do is get get media out there about what you are doing in the transportation segment and and then you know take that pr coverage and send it to these the potential customers in each of these places so that there is you know what we call social proof when the media starts talking about a problem then you know customers are also getting to know about it so when you are competing for customers, you can use that media to help those customers understand what is your unfair advantage. And then the, as the transportation companies realize that you're doing something that they can also do, they will be forced to do that because that becomes kind of the de facto standard of the industry. So these 40 customers in transportation, I think you should basically publicize the full ROI analysis, ROI modeling of your own experience with this software in your transportation company and, and use that as a wedge to drive into this sector. Lovely. Okay, um, so, so I think question. the first million in revenue that you are targeting from the transportation sector, this may be an effective strategy. Lovely. Thank you so much. Uh, I had a couple of questions from you in the next slide. Uh, no, one more, I think. Yes. So, yes, we are. So you like the way we are targeting. Thank you very much. Is there anything I'm doing wrong at the moment? 
I don't know. I, mean, I haven't looked at your yeah, your business or your strategy in enough detail to know what you're doing right, what you're doing wrong. What people do in your stage of experience, often what we see people uh, doing is uh, in the sales process and the sales methodology, even if you don't have salespeople yet, initially most people do the selling themselves. That's very common. But there, there is methodology that we teach and you know, every time we have an entrepreneur who rolls out the methodology that we teach, they get a lot of benefit out of that. So, so if you were, so one of the audits I would do with you is to put you through that methodology training, which which is part of our methodology, and then I would like you to implement that methodology so that you gain the benefits of having following a proven sales methodology process. Beautiful. I look forward to that. Is there a market for such product in the U.S.? I don't know. You're going to have to do the research and uh, find what competitors are there, what are people looking for. Um, So that's, you know, but it's easy to do that research. You should just go on the Internet and do the research and you'll find it. Lovely. Where you would probably, U.S., I don't know, there is likely to be, competitors in the U.S., but there are many markets that you will find closer to you in Australia, in the Southeast Asian market, where this product probably doesn't exist. So you would most likely, even if you, for example, if you just go um, take your transportation case study and you publicize that internationally, um, just within the Within that sector, if you, you know, here you're going to four, uh, three different verticals. If you take just the transportation vertical and go across geographies, you will probably find takers, is my guess. But you're going to have to do again. When we do strategy, we follow a methodology in our program where we do thorough competitive analysis. Again, we can teach you that methodology, but you're going to have to do the work. Lovely. I appreciate that and look forward to it. Thank you. All right, great. Good work so far, and I think you have something pretty high potential, validated and high potential. Thank you. Okay, Radha Ishwar, you're up next. Uh, hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Um, I have been incubating social entrepreneurs. Uh, people who I incubate are mostly unemployable people, people who have that issues in India. Um, they may be graduates, they may be doctors, but uh, they have uh, issues getting the right kind of job that uh, they like or they feel they are uh, fitting into well. Uh, next slide, please. I have also innovated on two processes. One is the innovation process itself, um, based on um, thinking strategies of uh, many people from ancient type Chanakya to modern day creating systems in General Charles Schuller, Eric Von Hepel, all these, and uh, the process is uh, very robust and ensures that each social entrepreneur is able to come up with the best business idea, social business idea possible. I've also innovated on a model for social entrepreneurship, which I call as a fractal model of social entrepreneurship, where a unit of a very simple and tight model of success is created, and that is repeated over many times. Um, next slide, please. I've been fascinated by entrepreneurship from small, and uh, but I also look at things from a social and environmental angle quite a bit. And I see a few gaps, uh, especially uh, the effort that goes into creating a proprietorship company is lost when the proprietor um, does not last or the charisma of the proprietor is lost. The business also dies. So all that effort goes away. So that bothered me quite a bit. And the second thing that bothers me is the kind of uh, uh, status um, uh, hierarchies we have in cities. Uh, literate people who are city bred have an upper edge, though they do not have as many skills except for networking maybe. And um, semi literate people from small towns, they are uh, all the time aspiring to do something big and something great. So they are uh, on their toes all the time, but uh, they are confused people. And the people from rural India who migrate into cities, um, they're often used as uh, servants or laborers, and 
you know, um, secondary citizens, even though they are highly skilled, simply because they don't know the ways of the city. Next slide, please. So what I do is I create a cooperative entrepreneurship uh, unit with all of these people put together and we innovate together and we come up with a very beautiful, sustainable, franchisable B2C enterprise with a simple offering, either products or service. And uh, they work as a cooperative. Next slide, please. So typically a fractal is uh, will look like this, where one visionary entrepreneur has a couple of manager entrepreneurs from small towns. Each of these manager entrepreneurs would have skilled entrepreneurs to actually bring in the bread and butter for the enterprise. And uh, the visionary entrepreneur is the one who faces clients and is able to get in, uh, uh, you know, is more like an aggregator model like uh, Ola, um, uh, model that we have here in uh, India these days. So um, next slide. I'm incubating nine social businesses. I've been doing it uh, over the past six years now. Uh, next slide, please. So, Can you talk about a little bit of examples of what kinds of businesses you're talking about? That's what. Uh, I, I'll run through in the next slide. Urban Mali Network, for example, uh, Migrant Farmers, uh, are turned into Mali to plant uh, using native plants only. They don't use any chemicals or pesticides. They use only organic materials. Water uh, consumption is cut down to 10 to 30 percent only. And um, they are very, very, uh, they've become very popular in Bangalore these days. We also mm -hmm. are able to make impact in their family. And the person who's running it is a PhD in botany. And the person who's managing it is from small town, and he's a graduate in botany. And uh, they are now doing landscape uh, designs and uh, uh, changing the way gardens look in Bangalore. Next slide. So this is um, Ideal Lab Innovations, which is coming up with uh, innovative affordable houses, less than 10 lakhs of rupees, 350 square feet, built-in wardrobes and uh, furniture, and um, 12 feet high uh, rooms, however. So, um, you know, these are a group of architects and engineers and uh, laborers who are managing this. Next slide. Um, this is a PHP Lifestyle Clinic where uh, an uh, integrative physician, uh, instead of simply uh, doing consultations, is going out and creating awareness amongst people about whole food plant based diet. He's also training caterers and cooks. Uh, to produce uh, this kind of food. Next slide. Uh, Palm Fresh Bangalore supplies organic and naturally um, uh, grown uh, vegetables and fruits, and it uses diploma holders in agriculture. All slab upscaling uh, does uh, upscaling of recycled materials using artists who can't speak much. Next slide. Then we have draft people who we are converting into green contractors. Uh, these are shy people who come from small towns, but now they are so, uh, you know, uh, aggressively uh, building green homes around Bangalore. Next slide. Horticultural therapy we researched and innovated upon, and we have therapists who uh, offer this to autistic children, mentally retarded children, people with cancer. HIV and a great success is happening, and they are also training other therapists to become horticultural therapists. Next slide. Uh, growing in nature is a, an enterprise that connects children to nature, and it also produces gamers from uh, BOP um, uh, status of uh, society who interact with urban children and who are able to teach urban children how to connect to nature. Next slide. We have uh, free spirits that uh, advocate natural parenting and music and movement of free style. And uh, a few others are also in the uh, meeting. Next slide. Lots of mentors and advisors. Next slide. Also connected with academicians of different universities. Next slide. So, so can we go to your questions? Pardon? Can we go to your questions? Uh, sure. 
Uh, that is, I spent these many years trying to come up with this very beautiful model. I've only bootstrapped. I've uh, never been understood by um, uh, funders or bankers, but I've been called by Niti Aayog. They loved my model, but since I did not have money to give in uh, half the project plan cost, they said they regretted that they couldn't fund me because they were funding all other universities. They asked me to join with the university, but I've not come across any university that understands the uh, sensitivity of what I do and uh, which will support me fully because they want to grab all the money that the government can give. So I uh, have been bootstrapping and I continue to bootstrap, which is when, you know, instead of having an on-site incubation center, I decided I will go virtual because now I have the model so clear in my head. I decided uh, online would uh, reach out to many more people and uh, self-study would make uh, more entrepreneurs and it would cut my overhead cost as well. I also tried to see if uh, people could help me develop software for it, but once again, I am back to bootstrapping and uh, trying to use uh, open source uh, software like, uh, I mean, uh, platform. But your audience is not necessarily an online audience. These, uh, you know, for example, your Mali network, you can't, you That's will not be able to hire Mali through. Yeah, the uh, model that I follow is the visionary entrepreneurs are incubated first. That is, they join the course first. They go in search of uh, the other um, entrepreneurs, that is, the manager entrepreneurs and the skilled entrepreneurs. And I will have course materials in local languages, podcasts for people who will not uh, be able to um, read things, all ably guided by the visionary entrepreneur. And at a very low cost, the cost for the visual, uh, visionary entrepreneur is as less as 25,000 rupees for the course. For three months to one year's time, it's a self-paced course that they can do. And um, everything is so very well structured thanks to my experience with these nine um, incubated businesses that um, I have, I'm have. i sitting down and putting all the course materials and uh, hopefully in um, a few months' time I would be ready to go uh, online. But even before I uh, went online, people are calling me and uh, I'm doing it manually with them over phone and email. So I think that uh, it will be a beautiful model. But if I need to go on bootstrapping like this, then it will happen at the rate at which it is happening. And then maybe one or two years' time, my nine incubated uh, businesses would give back some money to me. And then I could uh, go full back. But I'm wondering if it's possible to, um, you know, um, attract some funds even before that. Uh, nobody seems to want to uh, invest in an incubator. Everybody thinks it's an NGO activity or it's something that um, uh, attracts grants only from the government, especially in India. And uh, the second uh, uh, problem that I face is my ventures are all socially and environmentally oriented and they're so innovative. Simple ones like, say, garden service or, uh, uh, you know, selling uh, vegetables or uh, it is, uh, you know, they're giving you cooks or nannies who know how to grow children. So these are uh, very, very necessary consumer-based uh, needs that are satisfied, and they will definitely open up purses and bring in money. So I, I have to um, uh, wait for uh, seed capital from people for three to four months sometimes. Supposing I had the money myself, I'll invest in my um, uh, incubated uh, companies myself. So is there some way of getting funds like that uh, to start with at least? So I'll answer your first question. Can you bootstrap using WordPress? Absolutely. I mean, WordPress is a perfectly fine platform to do this. We run 1 million by 1 million on, on WordPress. I don't see any problem with that. Um, mm -hmm. Why is an incubator unfundable? Um, incubators are often funded by either corporations or governments or local or regional economic development um, players or high net worth individuals. They're, so I don't think incubators are unfundable, but that's, I mean, there are lots of incubators. There are probably about 10,000 incubators in the world. And they are all funded by somebody. One million by one million is funded by me. So, um, 
you know, that's you have to no, find I'm somebody if you myself, but you know, so then you keep. Uh, if you want an external investor who wants to fund an incubator, you have to find somebody whose mission aligns with your mission. So I don't think it is unfundable. There are lots of incubators running that are, you know, that are, it's not fundable by venture capitalists. If you go to a venture capitalist and say, hey, fund my incubator, that's not going to work. But, uh, mm -hmm. but obviously there are people who are funding these incubators. Um, how can you become a venture capitalist for your incubated ventures? Uh, so how does venture capital work? Venture capital, venture capitalists are fund managers. They raise money from what is called limited partners who entrust mm -hmm. them with their funds. And then the mm -hmm. venture capital people who are managing those funds invest in those funds and with an assurance of, with the promise of a certain return on investment. I don't think the kinds of ventures you're doing are going to generate that level of return on investment. So I don't think you would be able to become a venture capitalist funded by other limited partners. So that, I don't think that's a, that's viable. Um, uh, on on the other hand, the money that needs to be put into these ventures are quite small, but at the same time, the returns are pretty big because volumes are big. That's the beauty of this practice system because it's so uh, repeatable, and um, you know it uh, grows very big. But if you do uh, the numbers, they're not going to compute to become very big numbers. People in 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 the venture capital business, people are trying to make big dollars, or you know big rupees, whatever. It's like ten x kinds of returns. The kinds of businesses you're describing, there's no way they're going to generate ten x returns. So, and the segment you're catering to doesn't generate any kind of return. No, Farm Fresh Sorry, Bangalore. You. And this Farm Fresh Bangalore, one of the enterprises, has been approached by the government department of horticulture, and they are ready to give a grant for 5,000. If she is my entrepreneur, is able to supply to 5,000 families. Uh, but right now, she has to show proof that she can supply to 250 families. She is supplying now to 50 families. So from 50 to 250, she needs a small capital of 20 lakhs. That's not All venture right. capital. So, You're going to need to do that another way. Venture capital uh -huh. is not the right model for what you're doing. All right. So in your do? world is more the, a world of grants and nonprofit financing and stuff like that, which is not our world. We don't operate in that world. Mm-hmm. So I don't think one million by one million is the right place for you to get the kind of help you're looking for. You should look for help for people who know how to navigate the nonprofit world and the the funding that is available to nonprofits. Kind of um, what you're doing is great, it's absolutely you know unequivocally great. But how you finance these? This is a world of nonprofits. No, I. Uh... Uh, that's my fight from the beginning. That is why I've not uh, taken donations. I do not think that this kind of uh, work should be, a, um, you know, uh, classified as not for profit. We are doing for profit. Uh, we are working in the com commercial space, but we are doing good work, work that will not harm uh, the planet or society. That's the only difference. But, but that, nobody is disputing the fact that you're doing good work. This is not the domain of it. Ha the only way you can do it is either bootstrapped or you have to look for financing from people who are looking to, to do social impact investments. And that mm. is largely nonprofit. There's a little bit of social entrepreneurship funding that is for profit, but it's, it's very much impact investment kind of world. It is not the world of commercial investments. It's not the world of venture capital. It's not the world. You're using a lot of venture capital terminology, but it's not going to be easy to do this in a venture capital mode. So I'm not, I'm not very sure that, you know, if you're, if you're coming to 1 million by 1 million looking for financing, this is not something I can help you get financed. Understood. Okay. Lovely talking to you. You're very welcome. Yeah. All right, Mahesh, you. you're up next. Hi, good morning, Srimana. Good morning. 
Mahesh, again, you've talked to me several times in the last two weeks, so just do a quick yeah. summary and then go right into the slides that we need to go over today. Okay. Uh, hi, this is Mahesh. I work with uh, Oracle uh, in Bangalore. Uh, this is a concept called DASA. It's, uh, it's an AI and ML-based approach which helps the uh, people behind the product, the developers and the support teams to enhance customer experience. Uh, so that uh, there are a lot of specifics that are in subsequent slides. Uh, do we have time for that? No, right? Um, a little bit. I mean, um, you can talk a little bit about what you, how you do what you do, and then we let's okay. just go to. Sure. So no, this has got uh, two distinct, uh, distinct part, uh, uh, parts. Parts. Uh, the first part uh, generates. Uh, um, user flows from the user logs generated by uh, the application performance management systems and uh, on, on the basis of uh, the user actions that uh, how a product is being used by different people. The second part would be uh, mining the issues uh, databases and the knowledge bases to build the historic context. Now, this historic context would be mapped to the appropriate points of occurrences on the user flows. Uh, typically, the issues uh, that have happened in the past at those points where it has occurred. Now, these map flows would be then ranked in the order of popularity, uh, like the, those flows which are used by most of the users all the way down to the least used flow. So the developers, uh, uh, development and the support and uh, uh, teams can use this data and insights to resolve issues faster, identify and predict issues, uh, prioritize new features, development and enhancement. Uh, so, uh, and this product would be positioned in the uh, enterprise application segment. So that's, that's about it. So let's go to the slides where you are um, making the changes at the moment. Yes. So it, it's towards the last. It, it was, uh, yeah, this was done yesterday itself. Uh, this also was done. Also done. So here, uh, I had actually put the graphs before the tables, mm -hmm. and uh, now it's been rearranged, like the tables first, the data first, and then the graphs. Uh, I have added the percentage to uh, the units also, and I uh, 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 reworked the um, uh, sales and marketing cost uh, according to Oracle's traditional spending. So it has actually mm -hmm. brought down my cost a lot and has uh, increased my net. I'm, uh, so there's one other thing make, that I'm uh, noticing here. Um, you're saying you're going to reach only 25% of the TAM in 15 in 13 years. Why? Uh, because by that time, uh, the competition would have started working on this. And but a market leader in an industry should have a lot more than 25% TAM ownership. So this is a very conservative uh, estimate. I mean, with uh, some more marketing funding, this can be boosted easily. I'm saying the rock bottom. This is the least that can be achieved. Okay. Let's stay with that and let's see. So this is from the additional sales I mean, uh, uh, resulting from the customer experience. Okay. Fine. So that's, this is that's fine. This is fine. You can contact Susan and um, and start setting up a meeting with Paolo. Sure. Thank you so much. Do you have any any uh, no, last words? No, I think you have, you've covered everything. You can go ahead and talk to Paolo. Good Thank luck. You, Keep me much. posted. 
Yep, you're welcome. Sure, definitely. Thank you very much. All right. Is uh, Akta still in the room, or is she no longer here? Had to run, okay. All right, folks, we are going to spend a few minutes going over how to use 1 million by 1 million, okay? So um, first and foremost, this is a request that we have to you. If you like what we are doing here, please bring serious entrepreneurs in your friends, family, peer group, colleagues into 1 million by 1 million, people who want to learn, people who are looking for a good platform, good proven methodology to learn from, because we like to work with serious entrepreneurs. And the word serious is in bold because a lot of people have a lot of misconceptions about what entrepreneurship is. Entrepreneurship is hard. Entrepreneurship takes a lot of rigorous execution, and you really need to do things in a methodical way with lots of diligence and with lots of assumption that it's going to take you years to build a solid company, a real successful, sustainable company. And without those, that mental preparation, you're not going to be successful. Now, in terms of resources, you'll find everything at 1mby1m.com. We have a great blog. Just by following the blog, you'll learn a lot. And the Entrepreneur Journeys book series is another body of learning material. Very inexpensive, 12 volumes of case study-based books. By the way, we just did an audit. I think I mentioned earlier, we have 871 case studies at the moment that we are, uh, this program is built on top of. So about 12 to 16 case studies per book is what we have done in the packaging of the Entrepreneur Journeys series of books, and they each deal with a particular topic. So let's say you, you want to dig into billion dollar, billion dollar unicorns, or you want to deal in, uh, with bootstrapping with a paycheck, you will find books that are case study uh, compilations with analysis on each of those topics. Um, these roundtables happen every week. You can come week after week after week. You can listen to the, um, the recordings on our YouTube channel, and it's a massive body of work, again, that you can learn from on a regular basis and vastly improve your level of awareness and understanding of the entrepreneurial process. Our full acceleration program is 1M by 1M Premium. That offers you extensive methodology guidance. A lot of methodology topics that we were talking about earlier are all covered in the curriculum. We have a great online curriculum that is case study based um, that you can do from anywhere in the world at, in, at your convenience. So no matter where you are located, you can access the curriculum and you can do it at your own time. We help you with business development where we have connections that you want to access. We will con in connect you and in introduce in you into those connections. And we have strategy consulting, coaching, mentoring, whatever you call it, in a similar mode as you're experiencing here today, but they're private members only sessions. So the combination of curriculum and private roundtables where we do the project-based coaching is how we deliver this program, and that is how we have been able to scale this program for this long and for to this extent, and it's working really well. We're seeing great results. We, we have seen lots of entrepreneurs make great progress, and you can too. That is a resounding message that I want to give you, that if you follow the methodology, I am pretty sure you will make progress. Uh, we also help you with financing. If you have a fundable business, and we have to get to that fundability point, there are diagnostics of what is fundable, what is not fundable, what is missing if you're on a funding track, and then once you have those gaps plugged, we do have a terrific network of investors that we are very happy to introduce you into. And then media. We have a lot of clout in the media, and uh, we can get the word out about what you are doing using our media cloud. And, and what we cover, what we write about you is something that you can use as social proof into your media campaigns, into 
you know, establishing credibility with potential customers, potential partners, potential investors, and so on and so forth. Go to the website and look at the self-assessment. It's a series of questions that you should answer about your business. These are the questions investors will ask you, but we want you to ask these questions of yourselves first so that you can preempt all that and, and have your ducks lined up. This is a strategic planning questionnaire. It's available for free on the website. If you get stuck anywhere on methodology, you can also do the curriculum only option, which is 1M by 1M basic. That's just $99 a month. If you just, just sign up for 1M by 1M basic and spend considerable amount of time studying the curriculum, let's say 50 hours a month or something like that or more, you will learn a lot. You will plug a lot of your gaps and you will start getting a feel for the methodology. That's fine. That's a perfectly fine way for you to get into the program. Um, so dig around on the website. There's tons of information, what to expect from premium, what to expect from basic, FAQs, video FAQs. We have full description of the curriculum that you'll be using. Um, case studies, as I said, we teach the whole program on, on the basis of case studies. We have over 50 unicorn case studies, over 400 venture-funded company case studies, over 350 bootstrapped case studies, and so on and so forth. All this, the, the entire curriculum is based on those case studies and video lectures, video interviews, and so forth. The methodology is lean, capital-efficient bootstrap startups. The philosophy is bootstrap first, raise money later, or not at all. It's okay if you don't want to raise money and just build a company without outside financing, that's fine too. Um, coverage of premium members is something that you can look at, just get a feel for media coverage. Um, our October roster for free roundtables is completely full. Every week you have roundtables, so book your slot if you want to come and present and discuss your venture. We also have in-person rendezvous in Silicon Valley in Menlo Park at Cafe Boroni. If you're local or if you're visiting, please come by. October 10th is the next one, next week. And then we have October 24th, and then two more in November, one in December. Um, that's it. We are ready for Q&A. You're very welcome to dial in and ask your questions, or you can use the public chat to ask questions. Either way is fine. Um, I want to introduce you to also Irina Patterson, who's on our team, who will answer any question you might have about the program, Irina at 1mby1m.com. So, questions, folks? Anybody? Questions, comments, introductions? This is also a networking session, so feel free to introduce yourselves. <coughs> It was a pretty intense session today, so uh, we've covered a lot of stuff. Does anybody have any questions, comments? So Maureen, it looks like you're going to reschedule Aksa. She had to run. All right, folks, if nobody has any questions, then I'm going to adjourn. Um, we, are, we will meet you back here um, next week, and we'll continue the conversation. Remember, this is a safe working session. So you can come with any questions, any, um, you know, any issues that you're getting stuck with, and we'll try to help you remove those roadblocks and give you a strategy of how you can move forward. Mahesh Sharma, you're very welcome. It's uh, great to see what you're doing, and I wish you all the very best. Okay, see you soon. Hi. Bye. Is there somebody who has a question? Yes, sorry, quick question. This is Mohan from Australia. Um, okay. Now, you, yeah, you mentioned that we, you can help us with the sales methodology and also the media um, yeah. that, that can help us. Where do I start? What's my next step? How do I get involved with one billion by one? Billion? 
So if you want to um, just do the curriculum, you can do 1M by 1M basic. And, and that gives you access to the entire curriculum and you can just start studying the curriculum and learning the methodology there. If you want curriculum as well as all the other pieces, which includes um, coaching, you know, like this kind of roundtable coaching on a regular basis, as well as all the access to the media channels and so forth, that would require that you're part of the 1M by 1M premium program. So you can sign up for either of those online on the website. So I, I, I will contact, uh, reach you through the website. Uh, That's fine. Online. Yeah, lovely. Thank you. Can you please mute your line? You're basically disrupting the call. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. I look forward to um, contacting you soon, Ramana, and also meeting you personally one day. All right, great. Okay, folks, all the best. See you soon. Bye.